remember that song? It seems a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Who do you think you are? Um, I'm started off. What? What? Oh, okay. Whatever. Um, I'm grateful t- to Anth for starting the ball rolling last week with the subject matter that we're talking about. Um, he's called it, I am, is a complete sentence. And uh, so we're going to have a look at it a little bit more uh, tonight with uh, uh, other people contributing as well as Anth, uh, who will bring it to a close. Um, but this is difficult to articulate at times because it's actually countercultural to who we are in the West as people. Because if you think about it, what are we bombarded with all the time? It's actually we're encouraged to strive to be something, whether it be in education, career, family, possessions. We are geared to believe that we need to be something more. So if, if I am not my thoughts, which that video has just brought, we need to talk about that a little bit. Um, we often mistake <clears throat> our real self, our true self, for what our ego has constructed. And that's what we believe ourselves to be. And often the condemnation we feel for not being who we think we ought to be, we think it's God. We think this higher power and higher authority who is holy and perfect is the one that's basically holding up a measure and saying that we're not all we should be, when actually it's happening in our own minds. uh, I think it was Shakespeare that said, the masks we wear fulfill our roles on the stage of life, but in time they imprison us when we forget who we truly are. So we tend to pick out a costume of choice and the one that gets me the most validation and makes me look the best, that's the one I'll wear for the day. And so don't be deceived. We often think, well, surely if I am pursuing God, that is, you know, that's different. Well, actually, no, that can be equally an ego construct because the ego can be telling you, be this, be that, be, be more. It's still about being more. And we can get into spiritual practices and become conditioned to believe that somehow we're attaining when actually all it is is self-righteousness, which can be a bigger problem than unrighteousness. So remember the guy in the Bible who prayed, He says, I thank you, God, I am not like so-and-so over there. So let's be careful with that. Now, I love Brennan Manning because he said something in one of his books. And he said this, when I get honest, I admit I am a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and I get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I am trusting and suspicious. I am honest and I still play games. Aristotle said I am a rational animal. I just say I am an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. (laughs) I think how honest is that? How wonderful. But he was basically going on to say, that's who I can be if I let my ego run away. So the true self is not the ego or the idealized self as it can often be called. But who we truly are is this, and I'm going to say it, and I'm going to have to say it very carefully. But we are the totality of ultimate reality in human form. Now, get your head around that. It's incredible. Often we say, I am a human being. But actually, that's not quite true. I am being, or we could say pure consciousness, in human form. And often when we say, oh, I am a human being, we are separating ourselves from the whole by saying I am a rather than being. Do you get it? I am, I am just human being. So our true nature is beyond all the labels that we can give ourselves. And like Simba in The Lion King, we have forgotten who we truly are. And we limit ourselves in, in our ego bodies And we think the answer is found in some external form. So, where do our thoughts come from? They come from the mind. Now, anybody who's done any philosophy of any kind knows a guy called René Descartes uh, from the 17th century who influenced Western thinking greatly. 
Because he came out with a fa famous statement. He said, I think, therefore I am. Which put great emphasis on the mind being in charge of who we were, who I am as a person. And you can imagine what that did to the world. Because many people, you see, live with their minds, having taken full possession of them and pretending to be them. And their mind tells them who they are and who they're not and what they are and what they're not and what they ought to be. So the mind is the mechanism by which we create our suffering and our misery. We don't understand it at all, but it's our thinking that creates our world. The mind tends to operate dualistically, good and evil, right and wrong, mine and yours, in and out, and attaches itself to a particular viewpoint formed from its own perceptions and experiences, which can be very deceiving. The mind filters reality through its senses and emotions and feelings and constantly judges preferring one thing over another. Deepak Chopra says this, who was I prior to these senses and thoughts before I was given a name? Who was I? Quite a question, isn't it? But when all the labels are dropped, it's interesting that what usually happens to us is that we say, I don't know who I am anymore. Anybody relate to this? It's because the labels have dropped. So the path to freedom is not self-improvement, but actually dropping the self's agenda altogether because the self is made up of little bosses who are demanding all the time and has endless desires. Freed from these conditioned patterns, we have energy available to be directed by our soul. But we say, will I not lose? Will I not lose out? Where's my individuality? Actually, the opposite is true, because true individuality happens when the conditioned self is overcome and my soul gets to express itself in its true form. Einstein said, thinking is a wonderful tool when the mind is in the service of the heart. The mind makes a good servant, but a very poor master. When the mind is your master, what misery. So our divine essence is enslaved. We identify ourselves by a limited self-structure, doing, consuming, grasping, keeping us from the flowering of our own consciousness. Who I am has been decided by my master, my mind and its thoughts. The only way to get free is to become aware of the mind's antics and put it firmly back in its place as a servant, not the master of the real you. So Paul wrote to the Romans saying this, be not conformed to the pattern of this world, and we've talked about what the pattern is, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And often people think that's the removal of your mind, not the renewing of your mind. It means move from a two-dimensional dualistic way of perceiving yourself and the world. Stand back like the video said. Look and observe. See them for what they are and int introduce into your mind another way of thinking. I had to learn to be willing to sit with the discomfort of what I felt that my idealized self wanted me to be and do. And instead of responding to it immediately, I had to watch it and, and, and just sit with the discomfort. And finally, I found a way to escape it. Paul continued, he said, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity with God. Now, I was brought up that carnally minded meant that if I wanted to go to the pub instead of going to the church, uh, you know, or, or uh, watch the TV instead of praying, that was a carnal mind. I think we've been led astray there because if we think about what we've just said, it means that the carnal mind thinks dualistically. If I view myself as separate from God and not part of the same whole, what will that be to me but death? because I cannot survive outside of the whole. And what was said in Genesis was 
the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. That day you will surely die. So to be carnally minded, to be dualistic in our thinking, to let the mind dictate, it will bring death. So carrying on, being raised with the label that I am a sinner, remember I am at it, a sinner, was not very helpful to me. But Paul continues in another of his letters, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and get this, why? Because he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Wow, what a statement. Now, like Anne said last week, we struggled to stop at I am because we were taught that this title was only for Jesus and not who I am myself. The wholeness rests in discovering who I am and that I am one with the Father. Now, what's wonderful is the universe only knows this eternal me and not the pretend me. So just to finish my thought here before others take part, it's this. Rumi the poet said, you are not just a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. Now, for me, that is mind-blowingly powerful. For some, it challenges their desire to be unique. They feel they will be lost somehow in the collective. But in fact, the opposite is true. You will be found. What does it mean in the context of our conversation tonight? Individually, we can look at ourselves and think we are so small, insignificant, little me. When we perceive ourselves as separate selves, we only ever see you, me, they, as just drops in the ocean, not able to make a difference to anything. But when we realize that we're made of the same stuff as the ocean, and we are part of the whole one song, what is an ocean but a multitude of drops? We're not just separate me's going around in the world, but each of us are the entire we organized into a me. That's the I am. So in this material world of many, I am Chris. Anth is Anth. But in the universe of unity, there is neither Chris nor Anth. And I could say here, but probably we'll get into trouble. There is no God either but I might be in trouble for that. But the me becomes we. So when you think about it, when the wave cr crashes on the shore, they don't hurt each other. Little individual drops together when they crash against the, sh the shore. Don't hurt each other. Why? Because they're actually have become one with the whole. And it made me think that's why in essence, we can hurt each other because while I insist on being me and you insist on being you and we hit against each other, we're bound to hurt. But if we're willing to lose ourselves in the whole, we operate as one and all we do is create the power of the crashing waves of the ocean. So who am I? I am the ocean. There came a point where all that I thought, had fa uh, thought I was failed me. And I had to wake up from the character I was playing and make my way out of Plato's cave of illusion and find out the truth of who I really was. And as, as I have said so many times, I purposely wasn't looking for God. But when I finally came to the core of my being, I found God sitting there saying, what took you so long? So the next time someone asks you who you are, answer, I am. It might be a conversation stopper, but it will be the truth. Awesome. Do you like that? Hope so. It does me good, so I hope it does you good. So come on, guys. Hi. Um, it's customary at this point to say, if you don't know me, I'm Ruth Devonport, but maybe it's more appropriate to say I am for what we're learning. Um, I've been talking about I am is a complete sentence. And... Um, Sometimes it's just our mind is so busy, it might be hard for us to actually know what I am means. If I am is who I really am, um, how do we get to that place where we can feel that I am? 
Um, and there are like different ways to feel that, but there's a process I read about in a book Chris mentioned him, it's called Deepak Chopra, I think it's pronounced. And um, it was just a way, I, when I did it, I felt it brought me to that place where I could feel the I am. And I just wanted to um, take you through that process. It might, it might help you. Um, so it starts off, by, I'll just explain it first before we do it. It starts off by, we say in our minds, I am, and then you say your full name. So I will say, when I'm thinking it, I'll say, I am Ruth Devonport. Anth will say, I am Anth Chapman. And then I want you to just think about what, just for a few moments, let your mind let, um, think about the thoughts that come up, the emotions, what that statement vo evokes within you. Um, and then I'll say, think now, I am, and say your first name. So just insert your first name, then your thoughts and emotions around that. And then I'll just tell you to think, I am, and just sit with that. And then I'll ask you to just think about your, your, just your breathing just for a minute, your breaths in and out. Um, so I just want, I think probably it's best if you close your eyes to do it because just get rid of distractions. If I just sort of take you through that process, if you just close your eyes. And I just want you to just think now and just say, I am, and put your full name in it and just think about it. Then can you just um, say, I am, and just put your first name in and just let that sit and just think about that and the emotions and thoughts. Then just say, I am, I am. And just listen to your breathing for a minute. You're going breathing in and out. Okay, so I just, just wanted to take you through that process. Just, I don't know what, what you felt when you did that, but the first time I did that, when I said I am Ruth Devonport, I had like pictures of like family, of my job, of responsibilities. I had good thoughts and, and bad thoughts. It, was, it wasn't all bad, but it was the whole picture of things came up. And then when I said, I am Ruth, I actually saw a picture of myself as a child running through a field when I said that. So there was a lot more freedom. It, it brought me down into a freer place. And then when I just said, I am, I actually just feel the presence inside, who, who I am inside. And then I think the breathing helps to keep you in that place for longer where you can feel that I am. Because I think like when I said, well, I am Ruth Devonport and I had all, that, all those pictures, there's a story that builds up about you over your whole life. And then we start to settle in to think that's who we are. And um, like, but it's crazy to think that something that happened 30 years ago, you're attaching that to who you are because it's it's just past a long long time ago but it we get and the thing is if you get trapped it's like a story or you call it the ego and it's it's you can get trapped in if you think that's who you are um like you might you know when you come to that place where you're just i am because i am as you in this moment so i am now this is me that that all that past is gone and the next moment I am it this is me and you might get an inspiration a thought of, of things in that moment that you want to do or feel or say but you might then get this story in the background and the ego coming up saying but but that's not who you are you're this you're that you you're you can't do that and and it's uh, that ego that story is 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 not who you are but it's so limiting and it can bring, um, stop you being the I am, but, so I, I don't think we can physically fight and stop that ego and that story, it's so, uh, like, it's not, it's not fighting it off, I think it's basically, you come more into the presence of I am, and that becomes stronger, and it's like the ego, the story starts to fade, and it doesn't have the hold on you, so focus on, like there are, like I say, there's lots of different ways to bring you to that I am, but that's one that I found really sort of stripped down the layers to see that that's just things, that's just things that have happened. But just practice being in the I am, and that will 
go stronger, stronger, and that story that you've, we've thought is isn't us, and it isn't us, it starts to fade, it loses its power, and we become the, the real powerful beings that I am in the moment that we really, truly are. Um, so, well, that's, that's my journey anyway. Okay. Good morning. Yes. It's morning, not evening. Good morning. Um, I've really enjoyed um, what I've heard from Chris and Ruth tonight. And um, I know that I'm going to want to listen to it again because I know the pennies are going to drop um, on what they've said. Um, but I'm going to share with you now um, things that... Um, <laughs> where I am, and I'm not suggesting you replicate what I'm going to say, because what's really struck me from listening to both of them is that um, I know I'm not living the I am experience yet. I can see glimpses of it, but I know I'm not living that yet. So I feel very comfortable sharing where I am, but I know even what I'm going to share is flawed, even against what I've heard tonight, not, and it's not, I don't see that as a negative, I just know I'm on a journey with this myself, because how <laughs> can I not be the sum total of all of this history, of all of the things I'm aspiring for in the future, and of all the roles I'm playing now, some of which I like and some of which I don't, the idea that I'm not the sum total of those things, it's quite a, it's quite a revelation to, to retrain your mind, as we've heard, and to actually begin to think, because that is how we live. It is, I mean, I'll, I'm going to stick to my notes, because to be honest, I don't know where I'll go if I don't. Um, it is so easy, well, first, first thing I wrote down here was, I am is a complete sentence, because that is where we've been recently. And when I came two weeks ago, it was like Anth had been listening to my conversation. I was like, do you have cameras? Because um, it was the conversation we were having that morning, because it is so easy to qualify and quantify who we are against our past. We must be the sum total of all the decisions we've made and not made, all the words we've absorbed and all the words we've spoken, how we've seen others and how they've seen us, beliefs we have pursued and held, and how we have threaded all that into a story in our own minds for our this is me, and then we judge ourselves against that in a variety of ways. And if not the past, it must be the future, who I'm going to be, what I'm aiming for, the dreams I have, what I'm going to be able to get for myself, where I'm going to be able to go, what I can change, what I can solve, and then when I get there, then I will be and then even if we grasp that it's about now, we still find it hard to not carry all of the responsibilities and attachments for who we are now and the definitions we've given ourselves. So to ditch all of that is going to take a process of change. Um, and it's going to be a really personal challenge. But one of the things I've realized is where I'm gaining on it is I'm very much noticing, you know you've got an attachment if you feel a reaction when someone challenges your attachment. The things that make you go, ooh, the things that make you think, don't touch that, or the things that make you feel angry, or you want to push back, or yeah, the trigger, or the things that make you want to run, they're normally the things that, they're the places to start. Because they're the ones that are in your face, you're like, oh, that was a reaction. What can I do about this thing that's in um, my life now? And the one that is recurring for me repeatedly at the minute is in different... It keeps coming at me. You know when something just keeps coming at you and you think, yeah, the universe is speaking to me. I need to start listening. Is the idea that in some situations um, I need to do nothing. I need to have no role, no label, no... I need to do nothing. Um, I don't do that. <laughs> Um, and that's one of mine. Now, you will have different ones of yours. That might not mean anything to you, but you will have things that keep coming at you that are challenging your definition and version of yourself, and it's those things that I think we need to pay attention to because they're what, what telling us those I am attachments and how we're quantifying and qualifying ourselves. So I don't know what they are for you personally, but they will be the things where you feel offended. They will be the things where you think, I can't possibly do that or can't possibly be that. And they're the things to really pay attention to. Um, the other thing I've realized is that I really expect myself to be the person I was then, um, 
And sometimes I have to pay attention to the fact that it's actually not who I am now. The person in my 20s and 30s would very much judge me in my 40s. I don't think she'd be happy with who I am now. She'd call me backslidden, actually. She'd be very upset with me. <laughs> she would be very upset with who I've turned out to be. Um, but again, I've decided that that's a really good thing. Because if we're set in stone in our 20s, and then we can't change in our 30s. And I've actually realized today, I'm 46. Um, so I've actually realized today that my fifth, when I'm in my 50s, I'm probably going to look back and be like, what were you doing in your 40s, Jen? You really needed to get a clue and wake up. But I think that's okay. And I think part of where we have to learn to be in this detached state where we're not constantly trying to define ourselves is to just accept that you it, it's all moving. The whole thing is moving because that's what makes it living and dynamic and the flow we've heard about recently. And you, that is undefined because you haven't moved there yet. So I had a whole bunch of other things I could say, but I think I'm just going to end with a thought that I arrived at um, um, based on something else that came up this week. When, when Amp was talking about the I am and he was like talking about the the burning bush with Moses. And he, he said the bush was burning, but it was not consumed, which is quite incredible. So you're getting this thing that was I am, but it doesn't consume you. Um, and one of the, the definitions for my life um, was challenged, you know, here a few a months ago, or years ago possibly, when there was this line that says, you don't have to set yourself on fire to keep everybody else warm. And, um, oh, I, I just, for me... I had to just give myself away, um, make sure everybody else was okay, work out what everybody else wanted, fit in, and that was sacrifice, and that was godly. But, you know, you give yourself away entirely, and then you have to go on a hunt to see where you went. Um, and so for me, that idea of um, that's made me quite afraid that, that so much will be demanded of me that I'll, I, I won't have a concept of I am anything because I don't know where I am because I'm just hidden over there burning for everybody else. Um, and what the, the thing that really struck me about this burning bush was that it was an I am experience where it was burning, but you were not consumed. And the encouragement I took from it was in this journey we're all going on that makes us afraid because we get very afraid to lose our attachments, that it might make you burn, but you won't be consumed by it. So notice where you burn. And then be prepared, in that wonderful way Ruth has just expressed, be prepared to just sit with where you burn. Because it won't consume you when it's part of your I am experience. It will actually free you. Okay. What a, what a powerful uh, clip. I think it has uh, application to all of us in varying degrees. Some of you to the absolute of him throwing himself in front of the car. So I know we're getting on a bit, but if you can just give me your attention for a little longer. I know it's always tough on the mums and dads. You've got a great job. I appreciate what you do. But do want to just try and bring this home a little bit. Um, can you just also, while we're here, remember Jim and Mavis Miller in your prayers. Those of you who know Jim and Mavis. Jim had a heart attack coming into the weekend, and so we're keeping tabs on that. But please remember them. In your prayers, I also want to say a huge thank you to uh, to Chris. That's that's publishable. Is that uh, what you did? And to Ruth for having the courage to uh, come to me two weeks ago and uh, share that thought, and then the courage to come up here because we do this all the time. But thanks, Ruth. That was amazing. And then for Jenny, uh, for her always absolute honesty, it's so much appreciated. And uh, I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about where all that has come from. I know it sprung out of my talk on I Am, but it also sprung out of a story that I shared online this week, and I want to lead there and then just come out of that in a few minutes. I mentioned to you uh, last week about the biblical narrative of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis in the Bible and um, um, how... In losing their sense of I amness because of looking for something else to define themselves, Adam comes out with the statement when God's saying, Where are you? which is a question for all of us. He said, I was afraid because I was naked, 
so I hid. So our, our inability to live in the arm makes us afraid. It makes us have a sense of nakedness which is not true. And it makes us hide. But then this classic response comes in according to the narrative from God. And God says to Adam, who told you you were naked? Now, our perception is that Adam's perception of nakedness was a result of God's discontentment with Adam's choices, but actually Adam's response was a result of his own reaction to his disconnection from I am, because God never said, you naked, vile person who's so exposed, how can I stand you? He says, who told you you were naked? Where did you get this nonsense from? Yes, you are naked, that's not the question, but your nakedness has never been a problem to me, so why is it a problem to you? And so we invent and create for ourselves problems that are not in any way, shape or form, a problem to the divine, a problem to God, however you wish to define him. In other words, what is the source of your information and the basis of your assumptions? And I think that's come through what's already been shared this morning. <laughs> it is morning. It's worth noting and emphasizing, if we're going to place any weight on the biblical narrative, that it was not and never has been God at the root of that self-produced shame. The church has done that, religion has done that, it's self-produced shame and God was never in it, behind it or supporting it. And so this is where much of this came from. This past Monday, 13th of September... In 1931, it marked 90 years since the death of my grandfather, who, of course, I never knew. It seems such a tragedy considering how his life unfolded. Riding down a hill on the way to a football match on a not imperfect condition bicycle, he lost control, crashed into a lamppost, and sustained injuries that led to his death the following day. He left behind him five kids at a time of no social benefit system. He and his wife, my gran, had also lost a child at or soon after birth in 1926, five years previous to this, and had also suffered the death of a daughter at two years of age less than a year before this, and on top of all that, my grandfather was born to an unmarried mother in a Victorian workhouse in 1902. My grandmother, his mother, was fired from her job because she got pregnant. She was disowned by her parents who said, don't you think about coming home to us and bringing that shame? And rejected in mainstream society and so finished up in the cold confinement of the workhouse in Hemsworth, South Yorkshire, to give birth to my grandfather. When she finally married, she found another guy and married him. My grandfather was not adopted by his new stepfather, and so he retained his name of shame, my name, Chapman, a maternal, not a paternal name. And then issues of belonging and acceptance and identity and trust all get ingrained within that story as, as my grandfather as a little boy is not adopted but he retains the name that signifies that he was not born in wedlock. He's a bastard child rejected by society, should be fortunate in the fact that he now has a stepfather but retained upon him every essence of what spoke of his unfortunate experiences of life from the beginning and then of course the tragedy that followed that through is just horrendous at 29 years of age and the accumulation of incidents and experiences like this affect the mind causing us to develop attachments and they're often the unhealthy who told you that you were naked type 
They're the unhealthy ones that we have attached to, but God would say, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you weren't wanted? Who told you that you're not worthy? Who told you you're not accepted? And they cause us to lose sight of the I am as a complete sentence for us, and we all have those. Grandma remarried a guy my father always referred to as Platy. His name was Platt. My grandmother became Platt, had more children, to the stepfather. And when my grandma remarried Platy, my dad was four years old. And his memory is that he was sat on the curb in the street when grandma came home holding hands with the guy and my father's first introduction was, this is your new dad. Now imagine the shock, he's a four-year-old trying to make sense of the fact that his father has just died, he's been killed, and the confusion and, and, and the poverty and the no benefits and all of that stuff and the loss of a sister just before that, the same year that his father dies, and then he's introduced to his new stepfather, this is your new dad. How do you deal with that as a four-year-old? Emotionally, psychologically. And the problem was that Platy was also a violent and abusive man who then began to beat my dad's mother. So he now grows up in a home with an abusive father who was not particularly abusive to the kids but beat the crap out of my grandma. But then you have to look at Platy's experience. He would wake up in the night screaming. That's my dad's stepfather, my grandma's new husband. And when my dad finally learned the story, my stepfather, his stepfather, Platy, at the end of the war, had been in the trenches with his friend as an 18-year-old, talking to his friend, and when he turned to look at his friend, his friend was stood there with no head. It had been completely taken off by a shell, and yet he was still stood next to him. He'd been talking to him, and when he turned, that was his experience. So you wonder why he became what he became. You wonder why that experience overflowed, why there was an experience in the family from my grandfather. You wonder why my father was the kind of father he was. Now, he was not violent and abusive, but my father was detached in many ways because my father never had really a father. And I've struggled to be a father because my father never really had a father, so he couldn't show me how to be a father because his experience was you provide, you provide, you provide. You love and you provide, and that's all that he knew. So he loved and provided, but I had no clue how to be a father. And I'm thankful that Joel is only as much messed up as he is because he could have been an awful lot worse. And I say that for Joel, because Joel then has to carry that legacy. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? It's that legacy that comes from those attachments. You, you think all that didn't shape my father and in turn shape me. And you all have your experiences of various things that when we're honest and we stop hiding and we look, we see those things, but then we see ourselves as naked. But God says, who told you that you were naked? And then there's that mystical thing called genetics. The G thanks for passing that on stuff. It rem it's, it's remarkable to me because I see so many evidences of it. I cannot and will not wear socks with seams in. Now some of you say, what do you mean socks with seams? You know that bit at the end, at the toe, that has the sewing bit inside? I cannot and will not Wear socks with seams in. Now, that's a problem for which you should have compassion towards me because it means, it means even when I buy my socks at half price, it's £9 a pop. There's none of this or eight pairs with no seams in for four quid. You know, I need to make money because I have to pay for socks. Half price, £9. Compassion, come on. We'll be taking a collection afterwards, a sock collection. But here's what I'm trying to get through to you. You know, my grandson, who's one generation removed, will not wear socks with seams in the toe. He wears his school socks inside out so that his toes don't touch the seam. Now, you say, where did he learn that? Who told him that? Nobody did, but this wonderful thing called G-Thanks Genetics 
somehow jumped a generation, but he has it. What I'm trying to get through to you is that so many things in our lives that shape us and form us come from genetics, the unseen, and they come from the visible and the experience, and it causes us to become attached to that which takes us away from the truth of who I am and how that should free us. We all need to compassionately give ourselves to walking each other home. Home being the place where we understand full acceptance, belonging, being, not for doing. We all need the transformation that comes from the renewing of the mind that Chris talked about. Our spirituality, if it has any value, must be rooted in a common cause that recognizing we are all damaged people, we are committed to walking each other home. And if we would recognize that about each other, it would help us. It's interesting in there that the word cog is the middle word. Recognize. How many of you know that when cogs are not working together, everything gets thrown out? In a clock, the cogs have to work together in a mechanical clock. Otherwise, even time is thrown out because the cogs don't work together. Recognize is when we begin to allow those cogs to fit again together properly so that the flow of our life can release what it is that Chris said, where we are the ocean. So as I kind of wind this through, let me just give you one other little thought from Scripture. There's a story in the Scripture, in Luke chapter 18, it's in three of the Gospels, about what it calls the rich young ruler. Now, I would just call him the rich young powerful official. And he'd come to, to Jesus and said, what do I have to do to get eternal life? So Jesus asked him a few questions. He said, yeah, I've done all that. And then Jesus said a strange thing. He says, if you want what you're looking for, you're going to have to go and sell everything that you have and give to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven is the way that it's written. And Jesus said, that's the one thing that you lack. Now, now it sounds as though it's, it's anti-prosperity, as though it's pro-poverty, although, as though it's, if you've got anything, you shouldn't have it and you should give it all away. That's not the point at all. It says, one thing you lack... Go sell everything you have. It's about what he has, what he grabbed hold of, what was the definition of who he was, his attachment. It was challenging his attachment. His attachment happened to be to his position of power and what he owned because of that. And until he could understand that that was his attachment that was trying to deal with the needs of his life, he would never get free. So it says he went away sorrowful. The issue was not that he had wealth, but what it was to which he was attached. And that kept him from the state he was seeking and desired so much wholeness, amnes, eternal life, real life. His identity was defined by his attachment. His attachment was most likely the result of his past and the attempts to fix it or veneer, you know what a veneer is, veneer its presence with an overlaying of something, whether that be avoidance, overcompensating through distinct opposites, or clinging on to what is mine. But all of those things we do when actually what is happening with this man was a result of his attachment because of the past. Just like I could say with my family, so I can carry shame I can carry things because of my relationship to that family situation that I have to battle through unless I come to the settled place that Ruth talks about where I am. So in this quest, never lose sight of both the visible and the invisible. That's why an in, a visible... An invisible Christ is so necessary. The visible Christ, Jesus, the invisible Christ, the one who has always been forever and ever and still is and is the essence of all of it. To lose one or the other, the visible or the invisible, truly makes your humanity half blind. I believe the Jesus story, when seen not simply through its first century Middle Eastern cultural setting and understanding of the time, alerts and appeals to us to not overlook this vital point. It helps us separate the temporal from the eternal by pulling us into the only now 
and I am. That's all that exists. The now and the I am. What about the future? There is no such a thing in reality. There is only now. Well, what about what I will be? There is no such a thing in reality. There is only I am. What about my past? There is no such a thing in reality. Only now. There is no such a person in reality. Only I am. And the Jesus message of the gospel is to bring us to that point where in him we begin to live and move and have our being once again. It helps us separate the temporal from the eternal by pulling us into the only now and I am connectedness and consciousness. The antidote to shame, fear and needing to hide because of nakedness. So as we challenge our attachments and detach ourselves through the transformative process of the renewed mind, we must engage the mystical, the miracle is what the Bible calls it, as an intrinsic part of our human existence. What I'm saying to you is that you are more than you have become, but you are already it, and it waits to come out. That miracle and mystical do exist and are there and we can have hope for something beyond just the visible or the visible experience or the legacy that we feel has been the only thing that has shaped us. And so I want to read you this thing by G.K. Chesterton as I bring it to a close. Mysticism keeps men sane. That means if all you look at is just the thing, the thing will consume you. What Ruth really taught us about today, in essence, is the mysticism. It's allowing yourself to come into a dimension and an arena that goes beyond just it to an I. It's the essence of really the revelation of the Christ, bringing us back into our oneness and connectedness with God and all that he is and all that is around us. Mysticism keeps men sane. As long as you have mystery, you have health. When you destroy mystery, you create morbidity. The ordinary man, I like this, the ordin we're supposed to be ordinary. The ordinary man, the way it's supposed to be, and woman, the ordinary man has always been sane because the ordinary man has always been a mystic. He permits the twilight. He has always had one foot in earth and the other in fairyland. I love that because if you make it too spiritual, some people can't connect. So he calls it fairyland. He has always left himself free to doubt his gods. But unlike the agnostic of today, free also to believe in them. He has always cared more for truth than for, consist for, than for certainty. If he saw two truths that seemed to contradict each other, he would take the two truths and the contradiction along with them. His spiritual sight is stereoscopic like his physical sight. He sees two different pictures at once and yet sees all the better for that. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have been called. Let those eyes be open today so you can accept that flow and in the I amness of the moment find the wholeness, the strength, the being that you have been robbed of by your attachment to things which were never your fault. Father, help us to receive that, it to become a reality and for us to become free in the true acceptance of I am. Thank you.